name is Chelsea Dean. I'm a second year medical resident, and today I'm going to be talking about the hypoxic drive theory. Pretty classic. So this is my simple schematic of what that is. So you have a COPD patient and acute exacerbation. You give them oxygen therapy, and you have an increased mortality. We classically think of it in this way, that chronic CO2 retainers are dependent on oxygen chemoreceptors for their respiratory drive. So administration of oxygen therapy therefore suppresses that ventilatory drive. So just by a show of hands, who was like taught this in medical school or if you've read this in the literature? I was reading my NKSAP uh, pulmonology book a month ago and it was explicitly stated in that as well. So just an overview of what we're going to talk about today. We've already established what the hypoxic drive theory is. We're going to go back into uh, the origin of this theory, where it came from. And then we're going to talk about the role of hypoventilation, VQ mismatch, and the Haldane effect in either confirming or busting this theory. Um, and then we'll end with a quick note on safe oxygen administration. So the origins of this theory actually take us back to The Lancet in 1949. Two doctors, Dr. Davis and McKinnon, were looking at the neurologic effects of oxygen in COPD patients. So what they did is they took core pulmonary, core pulmonary patients and measured their levels of CO2 in CSF after oxygen therapy. I think, like we've all seen, um, COPD patients sometimes can become more sleepy, more somnolent, eventually develop coma when placed in oxygen therapy, and they were trying to figure out why. But then they have this statement in their conclusion that oxygen inhalation caused a depression of pulmonary ventilation in the patients with emphysema and resulted in a rise in arterial PCO2 and a fall in pH. And I think it's interesting that they have this statement because they didn't measure any uh, minute ventilations, uh, they didn't do any ABGs, but this is just what they postulated. And then, again in The Lancet in 1949, Dr. Kenneth Donald responds to this article with a case report of an emphysematous patient who developed a coma, essentially, after getting oxygen therapy, and then had this remarkable improvement after that oxygen therapy was discontinued. And he states, and I love how he puts it, so I'm going to directly quote the article here. He states that the most favorite theory concerning this syndrome is that these patients are so well buffered that they are relatively insensitive to carbon dioxide, and that their respiratory activity depends mostly upon anoxic stimulation of sinaiotic zones. The removal of the anoxic stimulus causes them to hypoventilate with further retention of carbon dioxide. So here we have it. This is actually the origin of the hypoxic drive theory in a response to an article that was looking at the neurologic effects of oxygen therapy. So let's talk about this. Let's talk about the role of hypoventilation. So in 1980, two French physicians um, actually directly confronted the hypoxic drive theory in a review article. This one physician, OBA, I hope I said that right, Dr. Freed, I said it wrong the first time. Um, he had an extensive background in actually researching the control of breathing in COPD patients, and this review article highlighted a couple of his studies. So the first study they talk about, um, they look at COPD patients in the early stages of acute respiratory failure, and they give them this O2 enriched air, which is an FiO2 of 40%. And this line kind of in the opening, they say that although literature is replete with measurements of blood gases in such patients, little or no quantitative information is available concerning their minute ventilation, breathing pattern, and mouth occlusion pressure. So they set out to measure those, basically those three parameters. So they took 20 COPD patients in the early stages of acute respiratory failure and measured their um, minute ventilation, breathing pattern, and mouth occlusion pressure on room air, and then again after 30 minutes of receiving an FiO2 40% O2. Um, and just a quick note, this value P0.1 is this mouth occlusion pressure, and it's essentially an indicator of inspiratory drive. So the results are here in table three. You can see, as we would expect, um, the arterial concentration of CO2 increased from 61 to 68, oxygen increased, but then interestingly, the minute ventilation only went from 11.4 to 9.8, and their margins of error actually overlap. And then this mouth occlusion pressure value went from eight to four. 
So in the discussion, they note that it's interesting that the minute ventilation only decreased from 11.4 to 9.8 after receiving oxygen. And they also mentioned that even though this mouth occlusion pressure seemed like it dropped pretty drastically from 8 to 4, the normal values for, you know, you or I, a normal individual, are around 2. So these COPD patients still have an increased inspiratory drive. They still are huffing and puffing trying to get air. And that also implies that these COPD patients um, have extremely high activity of their already disadvantaged inspiratory muscles, and that's potentially why they decompensate. Um, and they also talk about how as dead space increases, VQ mismatch also increased, and that could be leading to this hypercapnia we see, but I'll talk more about that later. Another study they highlight essentially is the same model looking at COPD patients in acute respiratory failure, except this time they gave the patients 100% FiO2. So they looked at 22 COPD patients and measured their um, arterial concentration of CO2 and oxygen and their minute ventilation on both room air and after breathing FiO2 100% for 15 minutes. Again, here are the results in table four. So you can see the uh, concentration of CO2 increased from 65 to 88. Oxygen went from 38 to 225, but again, the minute ventilation only decreased from 10.2 to 9.5. So that's only a 7% change in minute ventilation between these two groups. They also comment that neither the tidal volume or the respiratory rate were significantly changed after 15 minutes of O2 administration. So it's interesting that there was a pretty significant increase in the concentration of CO2 from 65 to 88 without the expected co-committant drop in minute ventilation, only 10.2 to 9.5. And they concluded that most of this increase in the arterial concentration of CO2 has to be due to other factors because that doesn't quite make sense. Um, and then this was further from their discussion, they just looked at these two groups and compared FiO2 40% to 100%, and they just noted that the values of their arterial concentration of CO2 and minute ventilation during room air breathing were similar, um, and they also thought it was interesting that patients who were on an FiO2 of 100% actually had less of a drop in their minute ventilation. Um, and then also of note, this study was repeated by Robinson, a whole group in 2000, with very similar results. Um, so OVA in this uh, research article um, has this sentence that I think could be presumptive, but I'm going to read it anyways. He said, thus, the tenant that pure O2 administration by removing the hypoxic stimulus causes a drop in minute ventilation, which in turn results in increased arterial concentration of CO2, cannot be sustained. But let's keep talking. These are the myth busters, but maybe this is presumptive. So this is like another graph. This is from a more recent review article in CHEST that actually compiled OBR's data. Um, and I think it's, it's a really good summary of everything that's going on. So if you look at that red line, it's minute ventilation. The blue line is the arterial concentration of CO2. And this is looking at how they change over time after administration of oxygen. So you can see initially, the minute ventilation does drop a little bit, but then it increases again and reaches a steady state, whereas the concentration of CO2 continues to increase almost indefinitely. Um, and so uncontrolled oxygen administration and acute exacerbation of severe COPD has a limited effect on minute ventilation, and this doesn't really explain the total increase in CO2, because it, as you can see there, it levels off while the CO2 continues to increase. So why is that? Well, let's talk about the role of ventilation perfusion mismatch. So let's go a little bit back to med school. So physiologically, alveolar ventilation and perfusion are well matched. However, we have two extremes. When you have no ventilation in alveolus, but you have adequate perfusion, that is shunting. But when we have adequate ventilation and no perfusion, that's dead space. So this is like the most important slide in my whole talk. Let's talk about hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction. So the strongest mediator for hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction is a low alveolar PaO2. What this essentially means is when you have, um, the body has a normal physiologic response that when an alveoli is not being well ventilated, 
the artery around it will constrict to shunt that blood to another alveoli that is ventilating appropriately. And that stimulus is a low pressure of oxygen. And so what this looks like when you place a patient on oxygen is you're increasing that FiO2 of oxygen. You're increasing that arterial concentration of oxygen. And that in turn suppresses this vasoconstriction and actually causes vasodilation. And that can lead to shunting and an increased VQ mismatch because you're getting blood sent to alveoli that are not actually being ventilated. Um, so, in 2000, Robinson and his group wanted to study the role of EQ mismatch during oxygen therapy, and they wanted to look at it in C2 retainers and non-retainers. So what they did is they took, it's essentially the same model as I've already described, looking at 12 CO2 retainers versus 10 non-retainers after 20 minutes of FiO2 oxygen. And they looked at ventilation, cardiac output, and the distribution of ventilation perfusion ratios. And they used the multiple inert gas elimination technique for, to compile their data. And the results were that VQ mismatch increased in both the retainer and the non-retainer groups. And they concluded that this was due to less uh, hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction in both groups. Um, they also found that ventilation decreased significantly in the retainer group only um, due to increased wasted ventilation or dead space. And so their overall conclusion was that although overall ventilation decreased in the retainer group, ventilation to lung units with a higher VQ mismatch increased, leading to increased alveolar dead space ventilation in the retainer group. And the way I kind of was thinking about this was you or I, if we got placed on oxygen, we would have um, a little bit of shunting that would occur. But in COPD patients that already have chronic changes, already have this dead space, that shunting is more significant and it leads to more accumulation of CO2. Um, this is another study done by Hansen, and it actually looks at a computer model of pulmonary circulation to tease out the different factors contributing to hypercarbia in COPD. Um, I'm just going to go straight to the conclusion on this one. They were able to found um, through just kind of manipulating hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction and even the Haldane effect that changes in physiologic dead space are sufficient to account for the hypercarbia developed in acute exacerbations of COPD. Um, and then this study is actually the second study I've already talked about done by OEA. Um, and I wanted to go back to it because they do talk about VQ mismatch. And um, as you may recall, initially that CO2 did jump from like 50 to 80 and the minute ventilation didn't change that much. And they attributed that other factor that could be contributing would to VQ mismatch. And they calculated that that increased dead space ventilation went from about 77 to 82%. So that's VQ mismatch. Let's talk about the Haldane effect. I feel like this goes further back <laughs> to medical school. So the Haldane effect refers to um, the interplay between carbon dioxide and oxygen and hemoglobin. So we learned previously that the ability of deoxygenated hemoglobin to bind CO2 has a much greater affinity than the ability to bind oxygenated hemoglobin. However, when you place a patient on oxygen therapy, um, you're going to get an overwhelming concentration of oxygen that's going to displace that CO2 from the hemoglobin. And so this is going to shift our Bohr curve rightward, and you're going to increase your concentration of CO2. Um, and so us in the normal non-CBD patient, we can increase our minimum ventilation and get rid of the, C the excess CO2 that way. But patients in severe COPD exacerbation, they have no room to increase their minute ventilation, so that actually can cause increased retention. So it's almost like more dead space is created from this effect. Um, so this is another study by Hansen that used a computer model in order to tease out the individual effects um, for hypercarbia. Um, and so they looked at hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction, the Haldane effect, and minute ventilation. And the results from this was that the increase in arterial CO2 that occurs in the absence of change in minute ventilation, and then when you take out hypoxic pulmonary vaso effect, that whole change in CO2 can be attributed to the Haldane effect. So let's go through it just a little bit. So this table here um, shows, they basically compared human cases, actually from OBR study, to these um, kind of synthesized uh, computer cases to look at pulmonary, um, the pulmonary circulation. So these are just comparing the ABG data between the um, real patients and the computer patients, essentially. 
Um, and this is, I think, a really interesting table from this paper. It goes through and it breaks down the contributions of each of these separate factors to the overall change in the arterial concentration of CO2. So in OBA's study, he found that the change in minute ventilation increased CO2 by a TOR of 5, the Haldane effect attributed about 7, and then this value is the increase in dead space, and that was 11. So what they did in this study is they went through and they fixed the certain parameters, and then they looked at the shifts. So in this, in this table, they had fixed minute ventilation, and you can see there's a co-committant increase in CO2 from the Haldane effect and from dead space ventilation. Um, and so you still have a, an overwhelming increase in CO2. Um, and I'm going to skip that slide just for time purposes. So the conclusion from that study was that the Haldane effect significantly enhances CO2 excretion and health, but its effectiveness requires a normal ventilation perfusion distribution. And so CAPD patients in acute respiratory failure are already disadvantaged by their chronic diaphragmatic flattening, muscle fatigue, and abnormal VQ distribution. So Haldane dead space interferes with this CO2 exchange, and it worsens as FiO2 increases. So this is just, in conclusion, hypercarbia seen in CPD patients with O2 can be explained by changes in VQ mismatch through the influence of hypoxic vasoconstriction and the Haldane effect rather than changes in minute ventilation. So what does this look like? So this is some ABGs from a ICU patient that was admitted this week that Dr. Freed provided to me. Um, and just to clarify, they're going, the um, time frame is going from left to right. So I want to start at column four, which was the admission um, ABG for this patient. So you can see they're not doing so great. <laughs> their pH is a zero, uh, P, uh, their pH is 7.09. <laughs> um, PCO2 is 133. Oxygen um, was 263. And bicarb was 40.4. So this patient comes in, obviously in respiratory distress, was placed on BiPAP with an FiO2 of 100%. But interestingly, the next um, ABG, ABG done a few hours later, they still have pretty significant retention of their CO2. It went to 91. And then the FiO2 was decreased to 50, um, and you still see that perhaps that was too much oxygen. You're still getting retention with a CO2 of 89. And then once that FiO2 is decreased down more to 35, you can see a little bit of the more normalization of the PCO2 and the pH. And I just, this is like a case study of one, but I also went back and looked at the respiratory rate for this patient. And I thought it was interesting that the highest respiratory rate was actually in conjunction with the first ABG, that patient had a rate of 25, despite the fact that they were on an FiO2 of 100%. And then gradually over time, the respiratory rate kind of calmed down. So when we look at this, I think the classic the classic thing we think based on what we taught was that this is due to suppression of the respiratory drive, that anoxic stimulus. Um, but what I found in the research was and in the literature, it's these two tables, that it's more due to hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction causing increased shunting in these disadvantaged patients, and then with a little bit of the Haldane effect as well. Um, and so just one last note, the other thing the literature says is that um, this theory can be very harmful because patients can come in with CPT exacerbations and we won't give them oxygen at all because we don't want to suppress their respiratory drive. It is always safer to give these patients oxygen and the recommended titration goal is 88 to 92 percent. And these are my references and any questions? Yeah, that's a good question. I think it correlates, I can ask the pulmonologist in the room, but I think it correlates pretty pretty similarly, like an 88 to 92 for the oxyhemoglobin on the ABG. So I'd look at the ABG rather than the, the O2 sat. All right, well, I guess we're uh, are we ready to vote. In my opinion, this is like the, one of the classic myths that we're all taught. So how many people think it's a myth? How many people don't think it's a myth? How many think it's plausible? All right, the moment you've all been waiting for.